Hello and welcome to Shipley's webinar today on proposal efficiencies that save money. I'm Mallory Price and will monitor today's session. Joining me are Brad Douglas, CEO of Shipley Associates, Kelson Forsgren, Program Director at Shipley, and Paige Frame, President and McKinnon Mulherin Incorporated. Thank you for the questions submitted prior to the webinar. If you have any questions during the session, please type them into the questions tab in your control panel. Brad, I will turn the mic to you. Okay, thank you, Mallory and Kelson and Paige. Thanks for uh, being here with us. Um, and for all of you who are on the on the webinar and, and uh, joining us, thank you. Thank you for investing your time and, and uh, showing your interest in this topic. Uh, those who have been on some of our webinars before know that we, we keep these pretty fast paced. Uh, uh, we did get an awful lot of questions on this particular topic as you registered. And we're going to do our very best to address those actually as we as we go through the webinar. And if you have questions as we go, there's a chat window in your navigation uh, bar where you could chat a question. Uh, time permitting, we'll we'll try to get to those. You're also uh, able to follow this through social media uh, links and platforms if you'd like. Uh, share it with others. Uh, but this is available as another means to communicate. So with that, let's get uh, right started with our, our content. We think this is a great topic. It's something a lot of us struggle with uh, as far as uh, proposal efficiencies. Uh, uh, this uh, Here we are. <laughs> We've got Paige, myself, and Kelson. And uh, Mallory, of course, is, is helping us navigate and moderate. And we'll handle any questions as we go. So here's what we, we wanted to cover based on the response we got from you as you registered. Uh, wanted to just spend a few minutes talking about uh, efficiency, you know, versus efficiency drains. To understand what proposal efficiencies are, maybe we need to first take a look at what what is draining our efficiencies when we talk about proposal development. So we'll spend a few minutes on that. Then we want to go through these these points here. Uh, and again, they're based around your questions. There were a lot of comments and questions about needing to understand our customer, who they are, uh, how do we plan and organize a proposal better? That's an efficiency, uh, right? How do we write, review, and revise um, and perfect the message? We're going to go through 15 surewire, surefire ways of being inefficient in your proposal. Uh, writing, and then we'll discuss some proposal uh, review tools and how we can do better in the review process and some things up. Okay, what we did is we took all of your questions, and there were a lot, and we kind of put them in a um, buckets, if you will. So there were several questions around how to use boilerplate content in our proposals better. So we will talk about that. Can we measure the cost of proposal development and the return on investment that we're getting? We're going to try to discuss that. And let me just state first, though, there is no easy answer to this. And there is no one right or wrong way to measure uh, the cost of proposals. You kind of have to make it your own, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, what's the best way to leverage subject matter experts? This seemed to be a real issue with several of, of you who are on this uh, webinar um, that it's hard and difficult to get content out of subject matter experts. Uh, how to best work with virtual contributors um, out there, you know, how to how to leverage and, and, and get their input. Tips for writing better, faster, and more efficiently. That was a very common question. We'll definitely cover that. Several of you said, how do we do better reviews to make sure we're not wasting people's time and we're maximizing our resources? We'll address that. This was, this was uh, it's not a funny one. It's actually a sad one because it's so common. What do we do when leadership jumps in at the last minute of a proposal and they all of a sudden want to change direction, change strategy, or use their wording instead of ours or instead of the customers? Uh, so you know, uh, seem to be a hot item with a lot of people is, is what do we do? What do we do? And again, there is no easy answer. This becomes a management leadership and discipline issue. And the point here, the key here, and I'll state it now so I don't forget later, is communication. 
if if leadership jumping into a proposal at the last minute is creating some chaos and disruption and inefficiency you've got to be able to talk about it and you've got to be able to discuss that with your leadership team about the impact of that because he or she may not see that and so communication is a real key okay just to get you a little bit engaged here on your uh, on your uh, uh, laptop or whatever you're using you you're able to actually uh, respond to this poll question. Let's just get, I just want to get a pulse on what you all are thinking uh, around this, uh, this question. Uh, so based, based on your experience, would you respond to this question? And then we'll, uh, we'll show you the results and see what is maybe the most common, based on the group here today, the most common inefficiency. Okay, the numbers keep changing a little longer. Okay. Um, okay, we're up to 80 something percent, 80, 84 percent vote. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's that's very interesting. And here's the results. Uh, so the highest response was that first one. Delayed solution development creates inefficiency. Boy, absolutely, uh, and that that that's something we've got to work on as, as far as communicating, engaging our team. Uh, lack of planning and readiness uh, uh, for the proposal is was a big deal, and only four percent of you said management jumping in at the last minute's a big deal. So maybe we won't ha focus on that a lot, and I'm glad to hear that. You know, let's let's keep that chaos out of out of the equation and 10% said we have no process or discipline. So okay, thank you for responding. That kind of gives us a pulse of of uh where we're at and um what your thoughts are on some of these topics. And so we'll we'll try to address those accordingly. We always kind of turn to a definition. What is the uh, efficiency compared to effectiveness? You know, we use these words interchangeably a lot. All of us do, and they're not really that interchangeable. Here's a definition of effective. Uh, adequate to accomplish a purpose, producing the intended or expected results. That's being effective. Being efficient, on the other hand, is performing or functioning in the best possible manner, not just getting it done, but getting it done in the best possible manner, and then look at this last part, with the least waste of time and effort. So when we're efficient, we're not wasting people's time or our own time or effort. That's the difference between being effective and being efficient. So being effective is about doing the right things while being efficient is about doing things right, and you've heard that before. So that's what we're gonna talk about this. Here's some actual data, all right? This came uh, from an, a piece uh, from the Daily Beast titled, Bad Writing Costs Business Billions. Uh, this is an amazing statistic. It's not my statistic. Bad writing is costing American business close to $400 billion every year. That's a staggering number. Yes, it is. Then he, he writes this, think about it. You start your day wading through first draft emails from colleagues who fail to come to the point. You consume reports that don't make clear what's happening or what your management should do about it. The website's marketing materials, and I put in parentheses, proposals and press releases from your suppliers are filled with jargon and meaningless superlatives. How does that relate to proposals? It, if if we're not clear, concise, accurate, to the point, speaking in the customer's language, we are not being efficient. And then he, he continues uh, and, and references another study. American workers spend 22% of their work time reading. Higher compensated workers read even more. That's a fourth of our day. A fourth of our day is spent reading. 
And how much of that reading is poor quality writing that we don't even know what the person's talking about, asking for, or what kind of reaction they want from us. Uh, so there you see another stat. 6% of the total wages on time wasted attempted to get meaning out of poorly written material. Think of the poor evaluator that's sitting there trying to evaluate a proposal that has meaningless jargon in it and does not even answer the requirement or the question. So what are some efficiency drains um, when, we, when we think about what's wasting our time or creating rework? Misguided win strategy. I would add here solution, you know, the delayed solution. It's very difficult to develop a pro proposal around something we haven't settled on. False starts, poor writing, Kelson all about us syndrome. The challenge is, <laughs> it is a real challenge. Uh, this is something that, that is probably a, one of the most common things that we deal with in proposals is the we, 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 all the way home. We, we, we talk about ourselves and uh, don't talk about the customer and their needs which is one of the causes of that uh, poor efficiency, the, the, the poor communication that we present to our customers a lot. We'll talk about that a little bit later, how to counter that uh, later in this, in this webinar. Good. Uh, rework, you know, we just categorize that generally. Gosh, it's so difficult every time we have to rework something because of, of inefficiencies. Poorly done reviews or lack of discipline. Several of you ask about, about the review process. It really does boil down to discipline and readiness. Is the person or is the team conducting the proposal review ready? Is it pl well planned, well thought out? And then, as we mentioned, solution uncertainty or delays and this idea too many cooks in the kitchen. There's just too many people that have, have an opinion on this particular bid or this particular proposal and it creates this disruption, this inefficiency. I'm gonna ask Paige if she would talk about um, these next bullet points. And again, these, these, these are directly related to, um, we put these comments together based on some of the things you ask us about. Paige, would you go through these, just kind of a, a bullet point at a time and discuss maybe some ways we can actually try to measure the cost of our writing or developing proposals? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, a lot of these things we don't think about. So it's easy to measure on a proposal the, uh, the hourly wage or the salary of your writers and your editors, those people who are actively working on the proposal, but, um, but easy to forget <laughs> things like overhead, other costs that are going into developing that proposal, as well as um, the hourly or salary of of other people involved, like your reviewers, your SMEs, um, maybe it's the CEO or VPs that you're you're taking their time to review it as well. Um, the opportunity cost of the people the people working on the proposal, both your writers and your SMEs, to be working on that versus uh, billable hours that they could be putting in, um, and then of course production costs, putting it together. Um, and then tracking things like how much of the material can you reuse and how many pages per day are you developing and um, and tracking these things really can see um, how much money you're putting into it and and whether that's the best use of your time making sure that you are uh, being efficient in all of those processes and giving the team your team the tools they need to work efficiently so that you are getting the best return on that investment. Thank you, and, and I just wanted to, um, and Kelson, you may have a comment too, but I wanted to focus in just a little bit on that uh, third bullet point, this idea of, of replacing billable hours. Um, this is something that's scary for a lot of companies, uh, and I think it's one of the reasons we don't measure this is because it's a scary number. When you have to pull someone off a billable project where it's billable to your another customer, you have to pull them off of that and replace them with someone else and put them on a proposal for a while uh, to develop a section or content or description or, or whatever. You know, it's, it's kind of a double whammy uh, there. And so 
that's one of the things Paige says, you know, sometimes we forget about. I just wanted to emphasize that because it's, I will just be kind of bold in saying this. A lot of companies don't measure the cost of proposals and they don't because it's scary. It's a scary number and it's concerning to leadership. If we go to leadership and say, you know, this proposal actually did cost us uh, $25,000 to get out the door uh, or whatever the number is. But uh, I would suggest we start and we start somewhere. And this is just a simple list. You could build this list out a little bit more, a simple list of where you can start. You know, just start with the wages, the fully burdened costs, the overhead, um, and, and start tracking it. It's not rocket science. You won't know if you're improving and you're getting better unless you start somewhere. Kelson, did you have thoughts on the cost of proposals? Yeah, a couple of things. One is, if you haven't done something like this before, then instead of trying to guess or be scared by a number, just go record it. Kind of like how you're doing your own budget if you use a budget for your own personal finances. Uh, counsel is to evaluate what you're spending and then capture that information and then make some decisions from that point going forward about how you want to adjust how you're spending things. Same thing with doing this. Track what how it is right now. Track what it is right now. Don't make determinations yet about this is good or bad. Just track what you're doing right now, and that gives you a baseline of sorts to be able to go from. Second point I wanted to bring up about the other metrics to track there at the bottom. Uh, you may not necessarily track all of that on the first time through. It, it does require another level of commitment to get to that type of information. Uh, especially when you're looking across uh, probably a, a broad spectrum, spectrum of proposals that you may be doing throughout the year. But it's valuable to get to that level of detail because you can improve uh, efficiencies by reusing specific elements of proposals and by tracking uh, how you're generating information uh, for, for use in a proposal. So it's, it's great information to be able to track, but it does require a commitment to uh, finding that information. Thank you. Great, great points. Um, we had a question actually come in. Um, the question is, can you calculate the opportunity cost? Um, great question. I, I already kind of responded to that, and the answer is uh, somewhat. You know, some of this is going to be subjective, but if I have to pull, let, let's just say I have to pull an engineer off of a billable project that they're working on to help me with a proposal for uh, 15 days. I have to backfill that billable time with somebody. That person may or may not be as qualified as the person I pulled off the job. So it may be a double whammy in the fact that I've got to pay uh, double billable, plus I may be producing less quality for my other customer with a second rate or second tier person. I, I would hope that doesn't happen a lot, but those are the types of opportunity costs we're talking about. When we disrupt one project uh, at the expense of producing a good quality proposal, you know, what? what is it costing us? We need to think about those those types of things. Okay. And sometimes that will direct you to maybe not pursuing a bid if you don't have a great shot, but it's a strategic decision. And if you know about this information going in, then you know, okay, all right, so we might be uh, losing this a little bit here, but the strategic value of what we're bidding is, is more important, and so we are making a conscious decision to do that. Um, well, gosh, let's take another question. Um, Mallory, thanks for posting these up. Um, can you discuss the process of setting up a proposal budget? and what the ratio would be between the proposal budget and the potential outcome. Okay, great question. Uh, it's a hard one, and it would take, you know, a while to get into detail. But um, setting up a proposal budget, uh, I don't want to oversimplify, but it's it's making a list, like Kelson said, just like you would do with your home finance, you know, your home and family finance. Uh, what is it going to cost as far as personnel? How many hours? And let's estimate. Let's say we've got a 30-day response time. How many hours, if we have a proposal manager of that manager, if we have a writer uh, or, or what have you, 
Um, so calculate the hours, calculate the fully burdened cost of that resource, um, build in some, some uh, unexpected expenses, and you have yourself a budget. Then start tracking burn rate. That's part of the key, is once you establish a notional budget for proposal, now you start tracking your weekly or daily uh, burn rate against that budget to see how you're doing. Are we going to need to allocate more or less? As far as how much to spend on a proposal in relation to the, the value of the contract, that's too that's almost too hard to answer because it, it really depends also on the strategic nature, the strategic value, not just the dollar value. Let's all admit it. Sometimes we bid contracts, we bid opportunities uh, almost to break even because it's of strategic value to us. So it's not just monetary and dollars, it's also this uh, strategic value that we have to calculate when calculating the potential ROI. Okay, good discussion. All right. Uh, uh, as far as proposal efficiencies, uh, one of the things we talk about is this idea of making sure we're planning before we're writing. A lot of the inefficiency happens because we fail to plan. So uh, we want to talk about, for example, kickoff meetings. Uh, I'm going to ask Kelson to spend a little time on that. Some of you ask about that. How do we be effective on the front end? Uh, so plan before we write. How do we organize? draft clear content. Let, let's talk about this um, planning phase of a proposal because really this is where this is where we lose a lot of efficiency. Kelson, will you um, just at a high level walk through some of the keys of a proposal kickoff? Yeah, the things that we uh, have talked about already with regard to planning are again uh, key factors in making a kickoff meeting successful and efficient. Uh, it talk, we, we're talking about doing uh, planning. Some of the bubbles that will pull up on the screen are things that, that deal with the uh, purposes of a kickoff meeting, things that we're trying to achieve. Uh, but if we're, if we're on the front end, as we're going into a kickoff meeting, if we do uh, planning really well, if we do uh, making sure that we're bringing the right uh, people together, that we have a right uh, a schedule laid out for what, the, what we're planning to do with the process of the proposal. If we're making preparation of the materials that we're going to provide to the people in the kickoff meeting, that we've invited everybody that needs to be there to participate, including reviewers. If we uh, have decided or worked with others to make uh, decisions on regarding assignments, who would have specific assignments. And if we, we get the information together about how we're going to execute going forward, then we can be really efficient with our time and other people's time as they're coming to this kickoff meeting. So those things that are indicated there are things that we're hoping to, uh, to get out of an effective meeting. We want to convey information about the opportunity, help people understand what's going on, why we're pursuing this, what's the strategic value for us, and even if you have other people making that presentation in particular, including uh, sales personnel, and that's an effective way to get that conveyed. Be able to make assignments to people, be able to uh, make sure that the team understands who has what role, and then making assignments and deadlines and things like that. Uh, this slide includes a lot of the different information that goes into the planning and the, the leading of an efficient kickoff meeting. So. A lot of people that are, that are uh, prompts there on, the, on the, who you can invite to the meeting, but look at that, the aspect of having uh, partners or people that are in your production crew or uh, salespeople or review people, making sure that they're invited to see what's going on with this overall process, when they're going to be needed in the process, and what their role will be. A writer's package is something that you can put together and hand out to those participants, especially those that will be contributing hands-on in the effort going forward. So things that are as, as, uh, ranging from tactical to strategic. As we're calculating, yeah, yeah, go ahead. If you don't mind, um, this is one place where it's common for us to become inefficient 
is we fail to communicate to the writers or whoever's contributing, including subject matter experts, virtual or co-located, doesn't matter. We fail to communicate the bigger picture. So they don't have the big picture when we're asking them to write content. They don't understand the win strategies and things like that. So I just want to emphasize this point, Kelson, as part of why we include those contributors, if possible, in the kickoff meeting. Right, and as you look at more detail of what that writer's package includes, you'll see there are features and benefits, discriminators. That requires some planning and effort up front. This is not a meeting that you have the afternoon after you receive a request for proposal. Uh, you're not ready. Uh, give yourself some time to get this information pulled together so you can have an effective kickoff meeting. Here's some ideas for the agenda, uh, things to cover and address to make sure people have a, a marching orders going forward, knowing what their role is going to be, uh, who to contact, where to get, get information, those types of things. And if there are, uh, there may be other uh, types of opportunities that you can split out into other smaller kickoff meetings. Not, ever, not everybody has to be in the same one. Uh, you know, use that judiciously because, again, we're talking about efficiencies here. Don't want to waste people's time. Uh, but that, uh, that goes also for a large kickoff meeting versus the smaller ones. Great. Thank you. A um, couple of... Uh... A uh, couple of questions you've submitted. Thank you. Um, one is who is responsible for planning the kickoff and when should that begin? That's a great question um, and it varies by company a little bit. But typically, if there is a proposal manager assigned to the proposal, that person is responsible for planning the kickoff meeting. If they're lucky enough to have a coordinator working with them, they can help. Uh, oftentimes, however, uh, in smaller organizations or uh, maybe more sales-driven organizations, it's the sales executive, uh, the, the lead opportunity manager that has to initiate this kickoff meeting because they don't have a, maybe a dedicated proposal manager per se. They're it. For those of you in smaller companies, same thing. Whoever's focused on that opportunity, it could be a capture manager, uh, could be the president of the company, a vice president, they're responsible. So just designate someone, make sure the role is clear, articulated, and plan an, a kickoff meeting for sure right after an official solicitation is released. I would suggest, however, that you do a pre-kickoff meeting. Once you have an idea that an opportunity, a formal opportunity has surfaced, you start now rallying the troops. But the actual proposal execution kickoff, boy, that should happen just almost, you know, a, a few days uh, or a day after you get the formal final solicitation. Would you, does that make sense, Kelson? Yeah, it does. And that's one of the questions, that, a lot of the questions that we have about, you know, doesn't planning something like this take too long? Well, if you try to plan a perfect kickoff meeting, you'll never get one done. Good point. So by starting and, and continuing to improve and realizing that this meeting is an effective way to launch the team in reviewing and in writing and preparing uh, and helps reduce their rework as they're going through, then that's that's very effective. So you know, if, if you're able to, if you know some of these things are coming prior, you have some templates and things that you've developed or can use to rapidly uh, you have some reuse type of stuff that you can actually use here. Make some decisions about uh, about who should be doing what and timelines, things like that. Gathering the information you need about the customer. Uh, even if you have some of those basic components, that's still going to be more effective starting out, and you can improve over time uh, to be able to get something started effectively for kickoff meetings. And then people will participate more readily and willingly as they as they see what these meetings become. Paige, I'm gonna ask you, because um, the reason we invited, by the way, Paige to join us is we've had a longstanding partnership with Paige's company, McKenna Mahern, and uh, done several joint projects together uh, as far as uh, business communication, proposals, um, 
Paige, do you have any thoughts? One thing I've always admired about the way you guys engage on projects with us is this very point of front-loading the project. You guys do a really good job of making sure we're all on the same page with clear outcomes, expectations. Do you, could you comment on, on that from your viewpoint? Yeah, absolutely. And you're right, that's very important to us. So we try to work um, very flexibly with our clients. However, they, um, whatever process they follow, we try to fit into it. But we do push very heavily on upfront planning and getting a plan in place before people jump in and start writing. And um, and it can be easy when you get an RFP, you're excited about it, some sort of solicitation, and just start writing, start answering questions. But um, the more you do that, the more rework you're gonna have in the end. And so, um, so we always make sure to make a point of having a um, carefully planned kickoff meeting and and definitely involving all the stakeholders in that kickoff meeting. So um, I absolutely agree with you, Brad, having the kickoff meeting as soon as you can is great, and also making sure that it's at a time when as many people as possible can um, join it so that you do have those people who are going to be reviewing the, um, the proposal later on need to be in that meeting because you might be making decisions that later on when they're reviewing, either they need to know the answer to those decisions or they might have a different answer to that decision and could throw everything off course. So um, so yeah, we, we definitely uh, propose and, and tell people that they should, um, should do those kickoff meetings, have everyone involved. We've actually noticed that um, not involving everyone, all the important stakeholders at the kickoff can increase a project cost by as much as 40%. And so when we're talking about efficiencies, uh, that's a huge one right there. Just making sure that wow. everyone who's important is involved right up front can save you a lot of extra time and money later on. Wow, thank you, yeah. All right, so that's, uh, again, there were a lot of questions about this and, and uh, out of a kickoff, obviously, ought to come a schedule, assignments, deadlines, milestones, and that needs to be documented. It needs to be visible. Uh, and again, that's where too many of us fall short is maybe we hold a great kickoff meeting. We It's, it's part co-located, part virtual, and then we just fail to execute. We fail to communicate afterwards. So earlier I, I mentioned, you know, one of our challenges sometimes when it comes to efficiency and proposals is we don't share with those who are contributing the bigger picture. So I just want to remind you, I, some of you may have seen this image before in our training or, or previous webinars, but it is so important and it's so often forgotten. Everyone needs to understand what are the customer issues. What is it we're trying to solve for the customer? What keeps them awake at night? And then for writers, contributors, SMEs, for management, what's motivating this customer to buy? What are they trying to accomplish? And then collectively, these issues and motivators make up what we call hot buttons. And if we would just do this, uh, at the, as Paige and Kelson have mentioned, on the front end of any proposal effort, make sure everybody understands the customer hot button. Now we're all going down the same path and, and trying to communicate the same messages. It's not about, like Kelson said, it's not about us and all of our features and all of our capabilities and how big we are and how global we are. It's about solving the customer problem. So include this in that kickoff meeting, that upfront engagement with others. And if you're the only one, one of the questions that came in, what if we're the only one writing all sections? Well, you've got to know then what the hot buttons are, the motivators and issues, because you're it. You've got to write every section and you've got to make sure all of them are are, are saying the same same sales message. All right. And make sure you're not the only one reviewing it too. You've yeah, got to have somebody else. <laughs> find someone else to review. Great point. Um, there were several questions about how do we better engage subject matter experts so we're not wasting time. This gets back to uh, opportunity costs, right? So here's a couple of points. 
and I'd ask Kelson and Paige to be ready to chime in here uh, because they've they've both been involved in uh, engaging subject matter experts. We need to be prepared. Be prepared to have a discussion with the subject matter expert. Help them, as I mentioned, understand the requirements, the evaluation criteria, the hot button. Make it conversational with them. Don't put them on trial. I, uh, this is an interesting one. Move off the solution. Like Kelsey said, it's not all about us. We don't need an engineer necessarily to tell us all of the specs on our solution. What matters is what those specs do for our customers. So help them understand that. Help them focus on the benefit and keep lines of communication open. Uh, Paige, would you have anything else to add for uh, either do's or don'ts in working with subject matter experts? Yeah, I would just emphasize the the be prepared bullet that um, making sure you have your specific questions for SMEs ahead of time and and know that you're talking to the right SME and, and confirming that ahead of time that the person that you're going to be talking to can actually answer the questions. Um, and also kind of part of make it conversational is it's very important to make sure that the SME knows that you're not going to be transcribing whatever he or she says that it they don't need to make it sound pretty make it sound compelling you just need the information from them and then you can take it back and finesse it and and massage it make it sound good later on because um i've found that a lot of times uh SMEs and, and very technical people get nervous talking about um, the solution because they're so afraid that how they're saying it isn't going to sound exactly right in the proposal. And it probably isn't, but we just need the information, make the most of their time right now, and then we can take it to the drafting board and clean up that language later. Boy, great points. I mean, yeah, uh, some, some SMEs really spend a lot of time <laughs> trying to perfect yeah, what they're putting. That's a great point. Kelson, do you have thoughts on on this? Yeah, some some ways to waste time doing this would be to just hand them a blank piece of paper and say, hey, tell me about this, because uh, they'll have that same issue that, that they would in speaking. How are they going to write? Uh, they're not sure how to do that. Uh, if we fail to state the desired outcomes of what we want in the in the interaction with them, then that can cause a problem too. If we're looking at getting answers, getting solutions, getting what, what the benefits are, if we can have them help us identify what benefits are, that's what we're trying to help uh, get from them to be able to answer criteria that we have. And then we can also make the linkages with any discriminators or, or themes or win strategies that we uh, know about at the beginning. Great, thanks. Good point. Okay, so this this was obviously a, a, a hot topic for many of you who registered, and so we wanted to make sure we spend a little time here. Um, uh, the other point, I think we kind of talked about this, but just want to make sure you engage the SMEs at the right time. If if we're engaging them too early, and we haven't even really uh, developed a notional solution, you know, it might be a time waster might be a real inefficiency. So engage them. This gets back to readiness. You know, be prepared, as Paige says. Uh, make sure the timing is right as well. Okay, now, one more um, efficiency drain, if you will. This is kind of an easy one, but it's often overlooked, and that is sometimes we waste a lot of time or we could save a lot of money if we would just learn to organize our proposal smart the first time. The most, a big drain is we get a proposal three quarters of the way done and decide, oh, let's move section E up to B section B, or let's move B back to B section F. Um, and we, we met, start messing around with the organization of the proposal, and now we may have disrupted the whole continuity of our message. So organize correctly the first time. And here are just three key points. Organize as you're told. A lot of government customers are going to tell you exactly how they want the proposal organized. Follow it. Absent that, if the customer doesn't give you real clear instructions, then follow the bid request. Organize your response in order of the, re the request. Absent 
much organization there. Maybe it's an unsolicited proposal or you're, you're just going off a sales meeting you had. Organize your proposal around what matters most to the customer, their hot button. Hit their hottest buttons first. <laughs> I don't know if that's a, a very good grammar. but <laughs> You know, hit their hot buttons and organize those in priority of what matters to them. So organization is fairly simple, but it's it's so overlooked. We go back after the fact and try to reorganize, and we've disrupted our message. It's become jumbled. Okay. All right. Uh, draft your content uh, efficiently. So let's let's talk now. And boy, we don't in a webinar like this, we don't have time to. You'll have copies of this, by the way. We'll, we'll post this on our website, so you can print copies of these slides. And this is an area. Where, you're probably going to have to come back to because it's there's a lot here about drafting, but let let's just go through this page. If you'd kind of just work through these these uh, categories quickly, and then we'll let people come back to these as as they have time as well. Sure, absolutely. So um, as you said on the previous slide, the first thing you want to make sure you do is get that organization in place and have your um, proposal outline, know what you're going to talk about in each section. And once you have that, you just want to write quickly. You want to get the information on the paper, um, get all the uh, topics that you want to hit, those hot buttons, your messages, and of course the specifics of your solution. Um, just get it in there, keep writing, don't worry about if it's got errors. Uh, then you want to take a look at it, make sure that you are, um, you'd want to start to introduce your editor or edit your own work and make sure that you're using your paragraphs effectively. Um, so having one main idea per paragraph, um, starting it with your theme statement that's, that explains what that paragraph is about, um, going from general to specific and familiar to unfamiliar um, so that you're guiding your audience along with you, um, explaining it along the way. Um, some ways to overcome writer's block are that you can, uh, of course, go back to your section planner organizer, make sure that you are hitting on all those things that you said you were going to talk about. Um, again, you're still writing quickly, writing continuously just to get it out and get all your thoughts on the paper before uh, finessing it and revising it. Um, and then talking to other people on the project, uh, just talk it out, stop writing for a second to make sure that you're, that you can just talk about what you're trying to say and, um, and figure it out in your head before you start writing or just totally change your working environment, go to a, um, a new spot, or um, for me, I like to just go for a run. <laughs> Sometimes as I'm running, I think of something new. Um, and from back. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and creating summaries for each section to clarify your thoughts. So um, not only is that good for you, but it's good for um, sometimes you might want to leave those in that you're that's where you're writing the most concise uh, response to the question is when you've got a summary for the answer. Um, and then just in general, some other guidelines um, follow general sequence on hot buttons. So getting the the benefit to the client, your solution, and then proving it and putting your examples in there, making sure that you're substantiating your claims, that you've got those um, uh, quantitative results, um, going ahead and addressing your weaknesses and showing how you will overcome them, uh, using lists to clarify it and emphasize. Um, <laughs> study after study shows that people just look at captions and lists and headings. And so making sure that you can use those items to put your benefit right there or making sure that your um, lists include exactly what your features and benefits are is super important. Um, and then of course summarizing key content with subsections. So going into more detail um, as needed. Thank you, Paige. And again, we, we would invite you to go back to this. Uh, th these are really just some good tips for not wasting a lot of time on your first draft and getting it done, getting it done e uh, efficiently. Uh, now, uh, Kelson, if you'll run through, here's another 
uh, item you're probably going to want to come back to because we obviously can't dwell on all these in this webinar. But we talk a lot at Shipley about customer focus. And if, if we start no, by knowing what customer focus looks like, it's way more efficient than going back after the fact and trying to be customer focused. So in your writing, try to be customer focused. And this counters that all about us that we talked about uh, earlier. And I just go ahead and flow these in. We're talking about making sure we're, we're tying and connecting with the customer because really our proposal needs to be all about them. How are they meeting their needs? How are they going to be benefiting from what we're providing? If we are keeping our focus on them, then it, it reduces the focus on us. Even when we're talking about past performance or previous experience or things like that, sometimes we can tend to get long-winded there, but we need to make sure we're making the connection between what, is, uh, what we did and how is that a value, going to be a value for the customer making their decision. That will help us uh, keep our writing more concise, more tight, and not bloviating about ourselves all the time. So come back and revisit this customer-focused uh, information, these, uh, these 10 questions that we can ask. Uh, and also, it's, there's a section in the uh, Shipley Proposal Guide about that as well that uh, expands that in more detail. Kelson, there was a question actually Mallory just posted for us. Uh, I'm going to go back a little bit because we, we keep referring to hot buttons and, and what the customer's needs are. Uh, someone here on the webinar asked, uh, what do you do in the sales expert? don't know the customer's hot buttons or problems, and yet they insist on bidding. Well, that, that's not uncommon to us, right? <laughs> We're going to bid this thing because I've got to make my quota. Um, uh, in that case, you do the best you can based on how you bid similar projects. So more than likely, you bid on a similar opportunity with a different customer. What were their hot buttons? or hopefully we've done our homework and our research and we know what's going on in our customer's market. What matters? Is it energy efficiency they care about? You know, what are the market hot buttons for that particular customer that they might care about? So that's the best I, advice I could give there is sometimes we've just got to go with what the market is telling us or what similar bids or proposals have told us before. Now, there were some questions here uh, that came in as you registered about boilerplate and reuse material. Okay, this can be a tremendous efficiency gain or a tremendous risk and danger. Gain or drain? Gain or drain. That's a, There you go. So these are some areas where you might want to think about, regardless of the size of your company, creating a boilerplate or reuse library. These are sections you can go back to and reuse uh, fairly often. Uh, these are possible sections that often we have to respond to over and over again. You know, transition approach, what about our systems, our quality, our key personnel, safety plans, contingency plans, company background. We shouldn't have to recreate that every time. So these are good ways to use boilerplate. So a few advantages, these are intuitive, I think but it's important that we know what they are. We can save money by using a reuse library or tool. Consistency, it gives us accuracy, but I will comment only accuracy if we keep it current. Uh, it's a great place for brainstorming and starting to develop content as Paige mentioned. Uh, you know, a reuse library can give us some conceptual solution alternatives. If we haven't thought of a solution, we can go back to a past proposal and, and ask ourselves, well, what did we propose to that customer that adjacent, in that adjacent market? And software and automation can help. Uh, and we're going to just show you logos of, of some automation and, and uh, uh, proposal tools that you might consider. We're not going to endorse any of them because that's not who we are or what we do. I mean, we try to use the best of the best. And, and again, there's no one single solution. So software and automation can help. Uh, Paige, would you mind just briefly talking about some of the dangers of using boilerplate? Paige, you might need to unmute. Sorry, 
sorry, Paige, that's my fault here. Kelson, will you go okay, through some sorry, of the... Oh, there we now. go. Okay. Hi, sorry, I'm here. <laughs> it was not letting me go, but there I am. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about these. So, um, as you mentioned, there's a lot of good things about boilerplate, but if you aren't keeping it current, then it can start to sound really stale. If you're not starting your boilerplate library today and it's 10 years old, um, it could sta sound outdated or just be wrong and outdated, which would not be great. Um, it may be too generic and not discriminate you against um, or have you stand out against the competition. Um, it requires a lot of management and making sure that you're staying on top of it and organizing it and keeping it updated. Uh, as you copy and paste, I see this happen all the time, that um, your answers may seem pretty close to a couple different questions in a proposal. And so as you're copying and pasting it, even though it sounds about right, um, those two questions have some small difference that you need to customize and fix it. So you you have the chance of being um, a lot more redundant when you're relying heavily on boilerplate. Um, it could sound like multiple voices if you're using boilerplate in some sections and not others. Um, sometimes if your boilerplate is too well written and has been edited and, um, and and says it perfectly and then you're scrambling to write other sections, there's this voice inconsistency. So you need to make sure that you're um, editing and reviewing those other uh, sections just as much. Um, and then of course the cost to maintain. So as I said about the oversight, having someone in charge of it, managing it, um, there's a cost to that. And you need to make sure that you've got uh, someone in charge of that and managing it, keeping it updated so that you don't fall into any of these pitfalls. Great, thank you. So just some really good reminders for us that there is no magic wand or silver bullet when it comes to uh, proposal content management and reuse. It, it does take uh, concerted effort. All right, uh, one of the efficiency gains we can save a lot of time and money on, um, and this was a couple of questions on this that came up when you registered, this idea of reviews. Review, proposal reviews boil down to discipline and somewhat to know-how. So here's just three buckets, if you will, of things to re remember when we're doing proposal reviews. This is any review, uh, regardless of where we are in the progression of the proposal. We have to properly plan. Uh, sorry to keep reiterating planning, but plan and schedule the proposal reviews. Identify the right people. What a waste of time to have people that have no business being in a proposal review being there. Uh, train the reviewers, coach them. What do you want them to be reviewing? And create an in-brief so that when you launch a proposal review, it's, boy, you're on target, people are engaged, they're with you. If you're disorganized and floundering, bad sign. They will shut down right away. Then you facilitate the review. Again, this could be early in the proposal, later in the proposal. Present the end briefing again. Uh, review uh, individual roles and responsibility. Discuss the proposal as a group and then report. Always have something to report out on. And then we want to always respond. So prepare, conduct, and respond. Uh, debrief the staff, support the entire team, distribute products. If you've updated the schedule, the outline, whatever it is, the compliance matrix, response matrix, distribute that update. Uh, archive materials. Make sure you've got a great archival system with the right permissions, execute and verify. So that's just a, a quick and dirty path to efficiency when it comes to conducting proposal reviews. They need to be comprehensive, a positive tone, and be constructive. So we won't dwell on specific reviews, but here's a notional example of the inputs and the outputs of a pink team review. A pink team review ought to, have, ought to uh, come up early in the proposal process to, to challenge and verify the proposal strategy. Do we, are we on the right path with our outline, 
Are we hitting the customer's hot buttons? Do we know their evaluation factors? Do we have the right sales and proposal strategies? We review that, make sure we're all on the same page, and then verify a compliance matrix. Another key review that comes uh, when we're almost ready to submit the proposal is the red team review, where we're reviewing a pretty much final draft of the proposal, getting input, feedback. Again, we need to plan and coach. People need to know what's expected at a red team review. We want to do qualitative assessment, as you see on the right side, and a quantitative scoring prediction. Someone needs to play the role of the customer and predict the outcome. We, Some of you ask, and, and I, I'm sorry we're not going to um, be a big endorser of one or two or three software solutions, uh, but boy, there's a lot out there, and here are some. Um, our clients, our customers use a variety of these. We use a variety of these. Um, but these are just some, you know, that you could check into. Some are uh, boilerplate reuse management systems. Some are collaboration systems. Some are process tracking systems. Some are RFP parsing systems. Some check your grammar and, and, and things like that. So a lot of automation tools. And they are good. They're effective to the extent that we apply them the way they're meant to be applied. Uh, Kelson, do you have any? Just one. We, we see it all. Yeah, just, just one comment. These will not replace the human touch, human customization effort needed for, your, for you to do something for your customer. You can get a lot of information in there, but to make it, you have to review it and make sure that what you are submitting to your customer is uh, customer focused. Yeah. So again, I, I know um, a lot of you are, are using different systems, and um, they're good. They're useful. They're powerful. Um, but um, be cautious. Make sure you're using them in the right way, and that you're you're properly prepared to invest in them. Okay. We promised that we would give you 15 ways to be inefficient <laughs> in your uh, proposal writing. So we're going to run through these very fast. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, and I would challenge you to look at your own proposal development activities and see if, if these fall into place for you. So, Paige, I'm going to let you be the voice of uh, Great. our 15 ways to be inefficient. So here you go. Okay, perfect. And I know we're running out of time. So we can yep. um, please do revisit these. They're, they're pretty funny. Uh, we're just using the uh, familiar poem of Jack and Jill to show how you can be inefficient in your writing. So first way would be to use weak verbs. So instead of um, fetch a pail of water, you could just get a pail of water. Um, next one, use unfamiliar words. Jack and Jill climbed up the hill to fetch a ewer of water. Um, unless you're selling ewers, that's probably not the right word for you. Uh, putting introductory phrases at the beginning to fetch a pail of water, Jack and Jill climbed up the hill. Um, makes it a little harder to read. Also harder, putting the action at the end of the sentence. Jack and Jill to fetch a pail of water, climbed up the hill. And this one I see all the time, putting modifiers in wacky places in the sentence. So Jack and Jill climbed to fetch a pail of water up the hill. Um, very confusing. And we always hear about passive voice. Um, the hill was climbed by Jack and Jill. And the next one is uh, passive voice with the subject at the end of the sentence. So to fetch a pail of water, the hill was climbed by Jack and Jill. Makes it even more confusing. Um, introducing false subjects happens a lot. So using it was or there are that don't really add anything to the sentence. Um, definitely makes your writing more inefficient. Um, we've got gobbledygook here. Jack and Jill ascended the acclivity to retrieve a vessel of Adam's ale. Uh, extra fluff that really does not add anything to the poem. Um, and turning verbs into nouns. Jack and Jill did the hill climb for purpose of water retrieval. 
uh, it sounds technical but is just more confusing. Uh, the same as the technical jargon, um, traversing the gradient to fetch an alembic vessel of H2O. And then more wordy phrases. Um, Jack, in the company of Jill, climbed his way up the hill for the purpose of fetching water in the approximate amount of a pail's full. Um, just more information than you need. Similarly, redundant words, so um, not just extra fluff, but literally repeating what you are already saying. So both Jack and Jill climbed all the way up to the top of the hill's summit to fetch a pail filled to its capacity with water. And then lots of cliches. Jack and Jill, who need no introduction, climbed up the hill by leaps and bounds to fetch through their good offices a pail of water by hook or by crook. Last uh, one. And finally, uh, turning down, stringing nouns together to form the subject, Jack and Jill, water retrieval, hill ascent was achieved. So those are a lot of good ways to um, to be inefficient. <laughs> so reversing all of those, making sure that you're um, aware of some of those pitfalls in your writing to uh, clean it up, be clear, be concise. Thank you. You know, we laugh at this, but yet, boy, we sure see a lot of it and um, definitely inefficient way to write. So in summary, and again, thank you for joining us today. And I'm sorry we didn't get to all of your questions. But just a reminder of what it means to be efficient. The best possible manner with the least waste of time and effort. That's what efficiency is. And we've talked about several ways to be more efficient in our proposal writing, our proposal development, our proposal management. Bad writing is costing American business close to $400 billion every year. Uh, so let's, uh, you can probably double that when you add the cost of losing a deal. And what it, what it costs us if we write a bad proposal or submit an unorganized proposal and lose because of the proposal, the, the money that that, that costs. Uh, so I hope this has been helpful. Thank you so much for investing your time with us. Uh, Mallory Page, Kelson, thanks for your input. And feel free to uh, check back. This, this webinar will be posted on our website uh, under the webinars uh, drop-down tab. Uh, we do these webinars roughly every six weeks or so. So here's, here's our next uh, upcoming ones for the balance of the year. We would invite you to join uh, if you have time and, and interest. Again, thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Brad.